Welcome to the end of Module 3, where we're going to be talking about telescopes and following Chapter 6 in OpenStax Astronomy. This video is meant to be an overview of the basic ideas and terms for this topic as part of the kind of preparation for a larger project on telescopes. So when we think about the reason to build telescopes to begin with, there are a variety of reasons. Telescopes have powers beyond what our eyes um, have. So the main three powers that we want to understand, we want to list them out and make sure that we understand them. The first is light gathering. So when we think back even to the very beginning of telescopes uh, in Galileo's time, when they were originally like big pirate spy glasses uh, and meant to see things far away, one of the biggest reasons that um, they are so effective is they simply gather more light. Uh, they are wider across than our eyeballs are, and so they can take in more photons, those particles of light we talked about in a previous video. That means that we can see fainter objects or dimmer objects. That helps a lot when we're looking for distant stars. They're very faint in our nighttime sky. Um, and certainly they gather the light. And if we build a telescope that can gather different types of light than our eyes can see, that all of a sudden our view of the universe expands dramatically. So when we build a telescope to see x-rays by gathering that light out in space, we get to see a view that our eyeballs simply would not. The next big power a telescope has is resolution or resolving power. So when we are looking with our eyeballs, we can see down to a certain um, fine detail. Some people have to wear reading glasses so that they can make sure to resolve the letters on the page. When we think about resolving fine detail, it isn't really about seeing bright things or dim things. It is simply the, the smallness or fineness of the structure we're trying to get a sense of. A telescope with a bigger diameter is going to be able to see smaller details. This is called the resolving limit. And one of the big things about telescopes is that Earth's atmosphere actually places a resolution limit no matter how good our telescope is. Just the air moving around in the upper atmosphere, any kind of turbulence, any kind of humidity, that limits how good our viewing is going to be with a term called seeing. Uh, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later in the video. And then the last power a telescope has is magnification. And although that might be the one that is easiest for us to imagine, especially if we've looked through binoculars or we've looked at the moon through a telescope, we get to kind of zoom in on this really cool view. And that's what we think telescopes are doing. But that's actually the weakest of the three powers. If you zoom in on something that is uh, too faint to see or is too blurry to see, you're just going to see a zoom in of a faint blurry thing. You need to have strong light gathering and strong resolution to be able to effectively use that magnification power. It's really easy to see the, the amazing effect with the moon because the moon is already well resolved and very bright. And so we don't have to worry about having the powers to see those small details once we zoom in on them. This image on our slide here shows the types of light that make it to the surface and the types of light that are blocked by Earth's atmosphere. And it helps us recognize that when we are talking about uh, telescopes on the ground, we are really focused on optical telescopes that is almost entirely visible light, a tiny bit of ultraviolet, a tiny bit of infrared, but primarily visible light telescopes. They're referred to as optical telescopes. And then radio telescopes, which look like a big satellite dish. It is a big, not shiny disc um, or dish around with a little receiver in the center. And we'll be talking about those as well. Those are also excellent for astronomy. If we want to study other types of light, we have to go out into space. So this is one of two examples of what it means to be gathering different types of light when we study an object. These four images are all of our sun, but they are images taken with different telescopes. On the far left, we have a near-infrared telescope from a ground-based observatory. That's Kitt Peak Observatory, or McMath Pierce um, Observatory on Kitt Peak. The optical telescope shows us the kind of traditional view of the sun um, and small sunspots. 
And then the remaining two, the ultraviolet telescope and the X-ray telescope, those are views of the outer layers of the sun that are very highly energetic and we would not be able to see them if we did not put telescopes into space. Similarly, these these five images are different structures within a galaxy that we're able to study when we highlight different temperatures and different sources of light. So you can look along the bottom, it's describing what is being highlighted. Cold gas in radio, cool stars in infrared, solar type stars in optical or visible light, and then ultraviolet uh, is showing us hot stars and the x-rays is showing us the hottest gas. And we get to see a much fuller picture if we can study all of these different types of light. So a big reason to build telescopes is to gather information that our eyes cannot see. Uh, and we're going to then move on now to talk about uh, what makes a telescope, the types of telescopes, and the different decisions that go into building them. It is strongly encouraged that you kind of pay attention to the specific terms here and any distinctions because as we get into the telescope project, you'll want to make sure you have answers to these different questions that we're going to see asked. So the biggest distinction is whether we are talking about a refracting telescope or a reflecting telescope. So let's understand the difference between those two. Refraction is a physical process where light bends when it goes through different materials. So from air to glass and then glass to air again, the light is being bent and when we shine that light through a lens or a prism, it is bent in a way that we can kind of plan ahead for and we can focus all that light to a single point. In order to have a sharp image, we want to have the light focused to a single point. Refracting telescopes use glass lenses to collect and focus light. The word lens is specifically describing the fact that light is going through it and being refracted. It is not a generic term, it is for the fact that light is going through the glass and coming back out again. A refracting telescope usually has two different lenses. The word converging means that they're trying to get the light to bend together. My glasses, on the other hand, are not designed to see distant objects uh, like a telescope would, but they're actually um, convex lenses to make sure that the light is focusing at the right place in my eyeball. We don't need to know the distinction, but that term is describing the shape of the lens, thick on the in the middle. The large lens at the very front is really what defines the refracting telescope aspect. The small lens at the very back, shown here at the bottom of the slide, is just the eyepiece, and you can put an eyepiece on any type of telescope. That is the kind of human element if we wanted to look through it to see what cool things we were pointing at. Most of the older telescopes, the ones that contributed to our development of modern astronomy from Galileo uh, to now, many of those early discoveries were made using refracting telescopes. They were relatively straightforward to build. Galileo's telescope was only a couple of inches across um, and super long telescope tube. This sketch on the far right is from Harvard College Observatory, also one of the largest refractors of its time, the Great Refractor, and you can see a person in the sketch for scale. Uh, that telescope still exists, although the dome doesn't open anymore, so it's more of a historical museum type um, of situation at that point. And then Yerkes Observatory was one of the very largest refracting telescopes of its time. In the image, we actually only see half of the full telescope tube uh, needed because as you get bigger and bigger lenses, you need a longer and longer distance before you can get to the um, focus point. And if you look at this image, you might notice um, a face or two that seems a little bit familiar from history books, uh, such as Albert Einstein. So giving you a sense of when this was happening. Although it was built in 1897, it's still around, it's still used, it might not be cutting edge um, astronomy, but it is still very relevant and useful to have a 40 inch lens. Now, when we think about refracting telescopes, they have a lot of issues, especially as we get bigger and bigger as needed for modern astronomy. The lenses are extremely expensive to make, that glass is really heavy and can bend itself out of shape. Because we have to wait for the um, light to refract at the other end of the tube, they become longer and longer and less compact. 
There's also this term called chromatic aberration. It's not an incredibly key part to our curriculum. It would be a physics topic for other courses. But it describes the fact that when we think about um, the very start of our light chapter, we saw an image of a prism, and if you send white light through that prism, it breaks it up into the rainbow. Even though we don't want that light to be broken up, if you have that curved glass surface, you're going to get a little bit of that same process of splitting the light up into different colors, so that the red focuses in one place and the blue focuses in a different place. To fix it, you need another expensive piece of carefully machined glass, and that just becomes unwieldy. So reflecting telescopes really started to um, be a big deal when we were able to make mirrors, so silvered glass mirrors rather than just shiny metal. Isaac Newton, even back in the 1600s, had a um, shiny metal um, telescope uh, with polished tin and copper, but it's not all that effective. We really needed the discovery of silvered glass mirrors, um, the ones that we're used to seeing our reflection in, uh, in order to have that really take off. Once we had that mirror technology, we didn't, we didn't continue to build large-scale refracting telescopes. And I really like this XKCD comic uh, because it does a great job of summarizing the, the cons, the, the downsides to both types of telescopes. All right. So, reflecting telescopes. We have a little bit more understanding of reflection because we've heard that term, we've seen our own reflection, but if we think about the flat um, mirrors that are in bathrooms as we wash our hands and we see our faces, uh, when incoming light hits that mirror, it bounces off at exactly the same angle. And it works okay for us to see ourselves um, because we're not trying to focus a distant object to a single point, but if we needed a whole bunch of incoming light to all meet at a single point, a flat mirror is not going to do that for us. So think for a second, how would we be able to make all of those lines focus to a single point if they're going to bounce off at the same angle that they come in on? If we think to ourselves, maybe we curve up the sides a little bit, we'd be absolutely right. We need a curved mirror. It's a concave mirror specifically, the way that it's curved. And that allows the light to focus to a single point. We could have it focus inside the telescope tube. We're going to see that in a slide in just a second. But one of the most common ways that we um, set up these telescopes is if we want to be able to look at them, we have this telescope tube and we want to look through the side of it. So we have to send the light out through a little tiny flat mirror. And that little tiny flat diagonal mirror um, isn't what is causing the focusing. It's just moving the light to where we can see it. So there are different ways to set this up. The prime focus on the far left is what I um, said before, that we can just have it come to a point in the telescope tube. If we are using that kind of setup, and many large-scale observatories do, that is where all the cameras and recording devices would have to be. And if we think about a satellite dish, that is what satellite dishes would have to use. A radio dish telescope has the antenna right there above that central um, dish because it is reflecting to that point. Newtonian focus and Cassegrain focus are different ways to get the light out of the telescope tube. New Newtonian is off to the side, Cassegrain is down to the bottom. You do not have to memorize those terms for any quiz or test or anything, but if in your project you see those terms, I want you to be able to recognize what they're trying to describe. And there's lots of variations. There's Schmidt Cassegrain, um, and I encourage you to, to look up whatever your assigned telescope is using. So in both refracting telescopes and reflecting telescopes, light is focused to a single point, and then in both of these cases where we're trying to use them for like our own observing, backyard observing, they still both get sent to an eyepiece, which is a small lens so that our eyes can see it um, as needed. And again, since the uh, 1900s, all major observatories have been reflecting telescopes because once we um, figured out this kind of good mirroring technology, uh, refracting telescopes were just becoming too unwieldy to get bigger and bigger, which is needed for the light gathering power, the resolution power, and the magnification. So when we are thinking about building a telescope, or when we are thinking about researching a telescope, there are certain aspects that we want to understand. We want to know what kind of electromagnetic radiation it can detect. If we are stuck on the ground, we are going to be focusing on either visible light or we're going to be focusing on radio waves. 
But if we're out in space, we can design a specific setup so that we know what kinds of wavelengths we're going to be expecting to get. Gamma ray telescopes do not work the same way as radio telescopes, even though the functional, like, reflecting idea is still in play. Then if we're looking up a telescope, whether it's um, to buy for ourselves or um, we're studying it for a project, we want to know if it uses lenses, which tells us it's a refracting telescope, or mirrors or dishes in order to focus the light. That would be a reflecting telescope. We're interested in the light path. How does the light, once it reaches um, that primary lens or primary mirror, how does it then reach the instruments or the detectors or the eyepiece for us to look through? So those different terms, prime focus, Cassegrain focus, would be the light path decisions. How big is it? Because the size of the telescope determines how powerful it is. Bigger for telescopes is better. And then we do want to know whether it's on the ground or in space. If we're on the ground, we are limited by the atmospheric resolution limit that I mentioned before. If we're um, on the ground, we have to contend with a couple of other things as well. So let's talk about those before we move on to space telescopes. So when we are building a ground-based telescope, we want to make sure that the kind of average expected weather at the site that we're building is reasonable. I don't think that um, cutting edge modern astronomers would choose Michigan um, to be where they build their telescope because we have a lot of cloudy days. And that's just a fact of where we're at. We have beautiful summers as well, but if we're trying to use this telescope year round, this would not be the right weather location for it. Not just clouds, but also all that snow. We want a really dry site to build telescopes. So deserts are a great option. That word seeing, I've mentioned it a couple times, but now it's on the slide. That is describing that limit on resolution created by the fact that we have to look through a whole bunch of air to get from the ground to space. So the higher up we go, the better our seeing is going to be because there's less air that's turbulent or humid or anything like that. So when possible, we went to high elevation. So the top of a mountain in a desert would be a great place. That seeing limit is much more of a problem for visible light telescopes than it is for radio telescopes, but it is still important for all of them. And then city lights. Light pollution is one of the single most um, important things that modern astronomers have to contend with. There's a lot of issues when you are nearby a large city. All of that scattered light in the atmosphere creates this weird orangish glow. We want to have a remote location. And usually, high mountains in the desert are pretty remote. So let's talk about light pollution briefly. These two images are um, what we would be able to see with roughly the same kind of exposure um, if we are in the city where all of that light pollution, even if it doesn't have a weird orange glow, is preventing us from seeing fainter objects versus out in the country where we might be able to see a lot more. And both of these images um, have a longer exposure than our simple eyeballs would be, so there is a better light gathering in both of these images than just eyes. But in either case, it is showing us a big difference here. The linked video here, the black marble, um, shows the Earth at night as it spins and how we can kind of pick out all of human um, civilization with all of the light that we're sending out into space. Images like this one, where on the left, we can tell what country we're looking at. I didn't draw any borders, I didn't put any labels, but we can see the outline of our coasts because it's black where there aren't any people in the oceans. Um, we can see the Great Lakes on the right image here. We can identify Chicago, we can identify Detroit, and we can even identify Grand Rapids. We are a fairly big city. We send a lot of light out into space. When we look at these images, I also want us to recognize that if the light is making it all the way to the satellites out in space, it's not actually being useful for safety and security on the ground at night. It is possible to build better technology that has kind of more shading over um, lights on the street so that there is more useful light on the sidewalk so that you have a safe path to travel without having that extra light go out into space and become wasted energy. Okay, so we've talked about some problems with putting things on the ground. There's the seeing, the atmospheric limit, weather that we have to contend with. Even if we're in the desert, we might have a cloudy day or wind. 
And um, light pollution is becoming more and more of an issue. If we want to be able to get to our telescopes, we can't put them too remote. So we've got this balance here. So why wouldn't we put everything out in space where we don't have any of these problems? The simple answer is it's incredibly expensive. And when we put things out into space, we are limited in physical size by what we can actually send up in a rocket. And so our largest telescopes are ground-based telescopes. And when we have problems with space-based telescopes, we have to be able to get to them to fix them. The Hubble Space Telescope is one of the most well-known telescopes that we have, um, but it had a lot of servicing missions over the years. And when it first started, it needed a servicing mission to even become useful to astronomy. And we don't really have the technology or capabilities to do that kind of servicing anymore, not without the space shuttle program. So we got to be careful when we decide that we need a new space-based observatory because it's expensive and we have to make sure that it can work on its own without our fixing and repairs. So with that in mind, I want us to kind of check in on um, what really is useful about a space-based telescope. So we're going to start with thinking about types of light. So read through the question and the options, pause the video for as long as you need to read and decide what you want to answer. Now when we look at these options, we see that I didn't give us an option of visible light. That'd be too easy. Visible light, certainly we know we can see. That's how we get sunlight and moonlight and stars. Um, so our next best option is going to be radio waves. There's this huge radio window that we do great radio t um, astronomy on the ground because it does not get blocked by Earth's surface. It doesn't have as many issues with uh, seeing and weather. Um, and so it is a great way to do ground-based astronomy is radio, radio wave um, telescopes. The rest of these are fully blocked or partially blocked. Gamma rays do not make it at all to Earth's surface, so if we wanted to study a gamma ray burst out in astronomy, we can't do it from the ground. X-rays, same problem. It does not make it to the ground, so we cannot study X-ray sources using ground-based telescopes. And ultraviolet is mostly blocked. When we have a telescope that, that claims that it can um, do some ultraviolet observations from the ground, it is doing very near ultraviolet, and there's a whole range of wavelengths that it still does not have the capability to see. All right, so with that in mind, let's think through what proposals would be useful to fund. So um, read through the options and consider what we've talked about so far and decide which of the um, suggested telescopes you would vote for if you were on a um, committee to make that decision. Now, if we look, we have to kind of go through some critical thinking here. There's different pieces of this question. Option one would functionally work. We could put a radio telescope in orbit around the Earth, but it would be incredibly expensive for something that we do pretty well on the ground. It would be hard to make the case for why it had to be in space with all of that expense. Number two is a pretty good option so far. We know that most of ultraviolet light doesn't make it to the surface. For number three, X-ray telescopes in New Mexico, we would see nothing at all. It would be a huge waste of money. Um, so we hopefully cross that one out right away. Kef definitely don't have any X-rays making it to the surface from space. And then infrared is also mostly blocked by Earth's atmosphere. An infrared telescope on the ground is always just seeing a tiny, tiny bit um, right next to visible. And really, um, most of it is blocked by the time you get to ground level. So Antarctica isn't at very high altitude, so it probably isn't, a, is, isn't going to see very much and isn't going to add to our understanding. So I hope that you maybe narrowed it down to options two and four. Um, and if I were on that uh, committee, I would choose option two. Uh, one of our most important uh, solar telescopes uh, has a series of ultraviolet uh, wavelengths that it studies um, in its orbit around the Earth. And that is has been and continues to be absolutely key to our understanding of the sun. So that's Solar Dynamics Observatory. And that is one of many ultraviolet telescopes around Earth. So in the end, if we want to see types of light other than visible light and radio, we really do need to make sure that we have options in space. 
Here are three images of um, the part of the sky that has the Orion constellation. A lot of the bright stars are um, linked here with uh, dashed lines. And we can see that that infrared radiation is showing us a whole different picture. These clouds of gas and dust, these cooler um, sources compared to the visible light of just stars. So as we learn more about objects throughout the semester, I want us to recognize that what we are learning requires telescopes to have collected and analyzed this data using our understanding from chapter five. That's why this module three is so pivotal to our understanding of what's yet to come. And it's worth recognizing that if we want a better resolution than we can get in our own atmosphere, then we need to go to space. Hubble Space Telescope does use visible light. It has ultraviolet and infrared as well, but some of its most famous pictures are simply visible light pictures. And although we can do visible light on the ground, there is so much more that we can do when we have a space-based telescope. Now, images are fantastic. They strike our imagination, they make us interested in what's going on out in space, but images are not actually what modern astronomers spend very much time looking at. In general, astronomers care much more about the spectrum of a star or galaxy, and not so much on this beautiful image showing the context of that light. And when we talked about spectroscopy earlier on in the module, in chapter five, uh, we wanna recognize that we're gonna to continue to see those tools show up in our discussion of later chapters. And then we introduced the electromagnetic spectrum at the start of chapter five, uh, several videos ago. And I want us to recognize that telescopes have the ability to identify and detect other things beyond light, beyond electromagnetic radiation. Gravitational waves are a expanding and relevant um, piece of astronomy, a whole new window on the universe where we are detecting the fact that um, two, two parts of a telescope, two parts of a detection system get physically closer and far apart as space-time itself uh, wiggles a little bit. Neutrinos are a type of particle that, similar to photons, have very little mass and move at roughly the speed of light, uh, and we can detect the effects of those even though they are not a type of light. We'll learn about neutrinos more in Chapter 16, as well as the telescopes that are built to detect those. And then cosmic rays are highly energized protons from outside the solar system, and they can interact with things that we can pick up with our telescopes as well. So I mention them mostly because they never got into the electromagnetic radiation, even though they sound like it. Cosmic rays should be something like gamma rays and x-rays, uh, but it's a poor name for something that was well, uh, not well understood for a long time. We now know that they are simply protons, ch positively charged particles that are just going incredibly fast through our solar system. And then the last two topics for us, the way that telescopes get bigger is not always just about making that um, mirror or dish larger. Uh, a very important way to scale up telescopes as we continue on is to have segmented mirrors. So JWST recently launched has segmented mirrors and it kind of unfolds itself or unfolded itself after launch. And radio telescopes use arrays, a whole bunch of different dishes that can then, uh, through computers, compare their different observations in a very specific scientific analysis way called interferometry and act as one larger telescope. So something that we see quite a bit as we continue to build radio telescope arrays is we build the arrays to be bigger, not the dishes themselves to be bigger. So a couple of resources to consider, especially as we research a um, telescope assigned to us. So parts of the textbook as well as astronomy picture of the day is always incredible to look through. And um, any discussion of the, the history of telescopes really has to be focused on the future of them as well. Several of the uh, telescopes shown in this image are in process of being built or have been built and launched uh, very recently. Uh, and so I encourage you to, to pause to look over all of these and, and consider which ones are able to make it into space and which ones are on the ground. Because when we look at all of this, these amazingly large telescopes 
just can't get launched. They are too big to be launched. JWST launched in 2021. The way it fit into the rocket was to be folded up. So uh, as our as our ideas improve, we'll get innovative um, and be able to build bigger things in space. But for now, we're limited by our current technology. This is the end of module three. I will see you in the next module. Thanks for watching.